I'd like to introduce uh, John McCarthy, who you may not know is also John, McCar John McCarthy, CBE. John is a journalist, writer and broadcaster, and he was also one of the hostages in the Lebanon hostage crisis in the late 80s and early 90s. He was the United Kingdom's longest held hostage in Lebanon, where he was held for over five and a half years until his release in August 1991. Um, before that, he read American studies at the University of Hull, and was actually working for the United Press International Television News when he was um, captured or kidnapped by the Islamic Jihad terrorists who then went on to hold him, held him in Lebanon until his release. Um, he shared several years of that cap captivity, a cell, um, and in some increasingly outrageous ideas for future adventures with his fellow hostage, Brian Keenan. Since then, his career as a broadcaster and writer has taken him sailing around the UK, um, back to the Middle East to look at art and architecture, and um, uh, I think actually involved in the um, marriage of Sandy Toxvig, presenting um, a programme called I Do to Equal Marriage, which was to celebrate the introduction of same-sex marriage in the UK. He's a patron of Freedom From Torture, which used to be called the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture, and I think maybe ultimately decided that a short name was going to be more helpful, um, and even has a bar named after him at his own university, which also gave him an honorary D-lit. Um, John is a remarkably uplifting, um, good-natured and philosophical individual, despite some of the things he's experienced, and I cannot think of better company for an evening at a fireside. So it was with genuine and very great pleasure Please can I hand you over to the estimable John McCarthy. Well, Honour, I'm absolutely touched and bowled over by that lovely introduction. Thank you so much. But more than that, I'm uh, humbled uh, by listening to and thinking about the work that the British Exploring Society does and talking about work for young people who are coming from very difficult backgrounds and circumstances and the opportunity you give them to not only get out and explore uh, wonderful parts and uh, of the world wild places but also explore themselves and meet other people and share their experiences it's so such a vital and wonderful thing to do um i, I wish i'd had such a, a real adventure when i was uh, a, a young teenager or a young man uh, that i'm sure might have set me in, in better stead for for the that hostage experience that you, you outlined just a moment or two ago. Um, I mean, I, I came from a very privileged background and I went to private school and the closest thing I got to an expedition was, uh, was um, uh, where I think a couple of outings, but certainly one on with the school cadet force. And we went up to the Lake District and you know had a, about a week, I think, uh, camping out uh, in our own camp under te in tents, of course, cooking our own food and going off across the moors, et cetera, orienteering and doing a bit of rock climbing and absolutely and, and that I loved, absolutely loved that. and would have, would like to wish I could have done more, let alone go on one of your expeditions to, to the Yukon or uh, Finland or Lapland or, or the Peruvian Amazon, all those extraordinary things that, that you do and take, take your, your expeditioners with you on. And, that, and that's marvellous. It's a wonderful thing. And I do hope everybody will continue supporting supporting you because, well, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a lockdown time for all of us. And it's, it's interesting, I think, having experienced a very long lockdown of my own which i, I will obviously talk a, a bit about properly in a moment or two when this all started last march i think when we, we, we were first in touch uh, i was thinking well i should be able to cope with this having with lockdown in, in, in because of covid having been through the beirut hostage experience but i found you know over the months that i i found it difficult i mean obviously i can go out on the street and go shopping and do all that stuff and make calls to friends and family um, but it's it still wears you down that sense of uncertainty and I think what you were saying about this crucial time particularly for young people facing so many challenges to their schooling to their future what's it all about as well as all these sort of pre-existing conditions of climate change which you know I'm 64 years old it's it's my daughter's my children's generation your uh, expedition guys generation that, that really face those things so it's 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 a, a huge pressure on all of us but especially on that generation and it's great if we can fire them up to 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 take on the world enjoy the world and, and fight for their place in it and also fight to do good in it as, as that extraordinary uh, young man was telling uh, telling us about what he's done with his life having been inspired by his own expedition with, with the bes so that's brilliant and it was interesting thinking coming on to talk to you i thought well i've never been on an expedition what can i tell all these uh, Roughy tufty types who've done so much traveling and, 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 and serious expedition work. But we're look, looking at um, 
uh, the, 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 your website and realizing that the original founder of, of the idea of, 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 the, of the organization, George Murray Levick, who'd been with Captain Scott on that last Antarctic expedition, and that he founded uh, this Educational Exploration Society, based having survived that extraordinary tough desperate experience in the Antarctic, but also that he'd come away with that with lasting and enduring friendships. And I thought, well, that strikes a chord with me because that's, whilst we weren't exactly on an expedition in the Lebanon, um, we, we did come back, we survived together, learned stuff about ourselves and, uh, and, and came home with a very, with lasting and enduring friendships and relationships. And I think that's something that can come to all of us and sometimes in very unexpected ways. Uh, but I think, anyway, to get to the cut to the quick, as I said, I hadn't really done anything beyond a short trip to uh, to the uh, to the Lake District, and then my first big uh, expedition was to Beirut as a young journalist, as you were saying, uh, Anna, uh, in 1986. Uh, the news agency I worked for, UPITN, had offices all over the world covering all the big stories all over the world uh, with with our camera crew, local camera crews. And Lebanon back in 86 was one of the, the biggest stories because of the tragic civil war that had been raging there for already for 10 years. And I went out the idea of being for just a month to cover for our regular office manager there um, while he was on holiday. And so I went out very excited. It was my first time outside Europe. Uh, and so it was very exciting to be in a, in, a, in a new alien culture, surrounded by people in traditional uh, Middle Eastern dress, speaking Arabic. Uh, it was the first experience of Lebanese cuisine. I and mean, it wasn't as ubiquitous as it has become now 35 years later. So that was all very new. Uh, and in you know, the wonderful Med um, uh, Middle Eastern climate, it was, it, was, it was beautiful to be in Beirut, but also, extraordinary of course because as i said it was the heart of a war of a war that had been running for 10 years every building it seemed carried the scars of war bullet holes and shell holes but what was extraordinary was that ordinary people were going about their ordinary lives in a very matter-of-fact way the resilience they displayed was, was was really struck me as much as as, as the devastation every morning I'd, I'd walk from my hotel across to my office and i'd see mums and dads walking their kids to school people opening up their shops shutters going up stalls being set out on the street everyone going around but then at any point there could be uh, uh, the sound of machine gun fire and when that happened Everybody cleared away immediately in a kind of well-rehearsed routine. The streets were suddenly empty again. And then there'd be a, a while, no more gunfire. And people would come back and keep going on. It was, it was extraordinary to see. Luckily, during that, that month, um, the first few weeks of, uh, of my time in, in Beirut, there wasn't much fighting going on. There wasn't, weren't many bombs or, sh or, or, or uh, battles as such which was obviously very good for the locals, but it gave me a time to quietly learn some of the ropes of being a, a local field producer. Uh, and I was enjoying that enormously. But then a few people, Westerners, two Englishmen and an, an Irishman, disappeared. They'd been kidnapped. Nobody knew where they'd gone or why they'd been taken. Uh, so I talked to my boss in London and he said, look, I think you just get out of town, John, and maybe we'll be able to send you back when we know what's going on. But clearly people are, are just being targeted. The, the three guys taken were, um, were all teachers. Two of them, Philip Douglas and E. Padfield, were, were tragically subsequently murdered, I discovered years later. Uh, and the Irishman taken was called Brian Keenan. So I agree with my boss, yes, best to get out of town. And so next morning, early, was driving down to Beirut Airport with um, one of our regular drivers and a couple of my camera crew colleagues. And we were just sort of chatting about how much I'd enjoyed it, how annoying it was to be having to go home earlier than planned. Uh, and then also my mind, you know, switched to with the journey ahead and thinking, well, you know, in a few hours time, I'll be back in London. I'll phone mum and dad and tell them I'm safely back, meet up with my girlfriend and other mates, and we'll go for a beer or two. The usual thing, thinking ahead. It was, you know, maybe 10 minutes from the airport, I was already sort of on the, on the plane on the way home. When suddenly, a car overtook us. We were driving down this uh, you know, fairly narrow street um, near, towards the airport and the suburbs. And this car overtook us at speed and then slammed on the brakes and sort of screeched to a halt, blocking the whole road so we couldn't go anywhere. So we just stopped, of course. And I remember I was in the front passenger seat, sitting, staring ahead and watching as this guy from the, the back door opened of the car in front of us, blocking the way. The guy got out, big burly young man with a big beard and a, and a big Kalashnikov machine gun. And he strode over and stood at the end of the bonnet, staring in hard at me for a moment. And then he came around to my door, pulled it open, leant in and grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and hauled me out of the car and dragged me across to his car, threw me in into the back and sort of jumped in on top of me, uh, shouted, yalla, let's go. And so the Got the driver of the car raced off and that, that, there we went and I'm down on the floor after a few minutes car stopped 
come and took me out and put me in the boot of the car and then we drove on again and I guess a few minutes later the car stopped the gunman and the driver pulled me out of the boot and they were standing on either side of me and we were outside this huge building I remember great big doors and a kind of dark black interior uh, I don't know what it was perhaps a, a warehouse or something but it was so so strange because I was like being in two worlds at once there was it's, it was, you know, it was a balmy April morning, a Middle Eastern spring morning, blue, completely clear blue sky, one or two trees uh, on, on either side of us, birds tweeting in them. So it was a lovely morning, and yet there I was, the natural world, if you like, was beautiful, but the, the human world was this terrifying experience of a gunman on either side of me and wondering what's going to happen next. And what happened next was that I heard footsteps. And from this dark interior, this guy walked out very quickly, and as he got to me, he pulled out a... Um, a piece of cloth which he wrapped tightly around my face, blindfolding me, took me by my hand and pulled me into this building. I can't see where I'm going. And then he takes me down a spiral staircase. I'm thinking I'm going to fall over and break something, get to the bottom of the staircase. He pushes me along a corridor. And then, and then I think we turned one way and then another way. And then he gave me a shove and I stepped into what smelled like a small space. And there was something soft under my feet. And then I had a bang behind me and realized I'd been shut in, the door shut behind me. And found myself, I took the blindfold off very carefully, and found myself in this tiny space. Uh, and it was a little cell. And that was, I realized, you know, I'd been taken. And it sort of, I tried to be optimistic, thinking surely I'll be going home in a few days. And, you know, they've got the wrong bloke. I'm not very, I'm not worth anything. I'm just a, you know, an unknown journalist. I'm not a businessman or a diplomat or, or even a famous journal, you know. Surely they'll, they'll realise I'm, I'm of no value and I'll be going home. And I was stuck in that underground uh, solitary cell for a couple of months. Uh, and it was awful. I mean, I, on the physical level, um, it was it was getting hotter and hotter under there. There was a very sort of rudimentary system of, uh, of fans that would turn the air over. But most of the time there were power cuts as they were right across Beirut in those days. So, so that it would get incredibly hot and we'd be in the dark and the mosquitoes would be buzzing around you, attacking you, attacking you. So you had to get under the blanket, filthy, dirty blanket, um, to try and get away from the mosquitoes and just get hotter and hotter. It was very unpleasant physically. And once a day, guards would come and they'd take me and I realized there were other prisoners on that corridor. One by one, we'd be taken blindfolded to, to the bathroom, disgusting bathroom at the end, and then they'd come back and there'd be some bread and cheese and a fresh jug of water, and that would be it for the next 24 hours. Um, which was which was grim and as the time went on i'm thinking will i be all right how can i hang on you know this is this is very frightening and it got worse because uh, uh another prisoner a new prisoner came into the block obviously an arab and i could tell that because he would be screaming in arabic every day when the guards came and took us the rest of us to the bathroom and gave us the food and stuff they beat this guy up and after a while he'd be screaming and screaming and they'd go away and after a few days they came back having beaten him up already and beat him again and it was horrible because he was screaming and screaming and then they suddenly shot him and i realized how then you know i just put my hand on the wall of my cell and say i'm so sorry for you whoever you are to have died in such a terrible awful physically beaten and abused way but also so frightened and, and not being able to say goodbye to your family and friends and of course that you know that reflected on that and thought well, what about what about me you know i they haven't Nobody's threatened me since the kidnap, but they might do, they might shoot me, or I could get ill, this place is, you know. And I, I look back on my life and thought, what's it all been about? And luckily I didn't go too far downhill and just thought, I've got to, got to try and stay strong. And within a few, well, it was, must have been a couple of weeks at that time, or less than that perhaps, a guard came at a strange time of day and said, right, we're going. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant, I'm going home. Uh, but I wasn't, it was just the, the first of a number of moves. Um, 12 moves over all the years uh, to another location this time we just sat in i was put in the back of a van uh, with other i could tell there were other one or two other prisoners there uh, as well as the gunmen who were sort of prodding us with their pistols and stuff to keep quiet and we were taken across uh, the southern suburbs of beirut and i was bundled out and thrown into a room uh, which i sensed was much bigger than that tiny cell i'd been in in solitary uh, and i also sensed there was somebody else there and i remember sort of taking the blindfold off very carefully as the door slammed shut behind me and looked and there was another pair of shoes another shirt and pair of jeans and shirt another hand taken off another blindfold and but that's behind that blindfold was this really crazy looking guy i mean looked demented with hair uh, beard hair and beard looking completely wild and wide wi wild eyes staring at me and i sort of remember backing up to the door but thinking this guy looks rather dangerous <laughs> maybe maybe solitary confinement wasn't so bad after all and then i looked at him again i thought oh my god 
if I could trim that hair back, so to speak, that's that Irishman, Brian Keenan, the teacher who was kidnapped a few days before me from Ireland. And as I said, hello, how do you do? John McCarthy, very English. And, uh, and we started talking. And he'd been in that underground prison too. He'd witnessed the tragic abuse and murder, of, or heard the, the tragic abuse and murder of the, of the other young prisoner. Uh, and so we, we started talking. I, I, Brian's from Belfast, and initially I couldn't really follow his accent, and he found my posh accent. He kept calling me Prince Charles. Too difficult to follow, but gradually we did, and we always had to whisper throughout the time we were together. And it's extraordinary. It really is extraordinary to look back and think. I think if we'd met outside that experience, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't have got to know each other at all. We wouldn't have been interested. We wouldn't have thought we were interesting to each other. Uh, Brian, you know, there I am, this middle-class, Middle England, posh-sounding public schoolboy. Brian was from Belfast. He'd grown up during the Troubles from a working-class background. Totally different life experiences. I probably would, would have thought that we hadn't got much in common at all. But there we were, thrust together. And it was an extraordinary learning, learning curve because we would, as it, once we got used to each other's accents, we, we, you know, we supported each other through four years solid together, 24-7, sometimes sharing our cells with uh, some American hostages, but basically on our own for much most of the time. And we proved to be a remarkable resource for each other. And I think that it was that difference of background that was a vital part of it. We also luckily shared a sense of humor. So we made each other laugh a lot, which was brilliant in dispelling, you know, the inevitable sort of tensions that did build up a bit um, when we were locked in rooms, sometimes for six foot by six foot underground for months on end. Uh, and th that was, that was re re really helpful that we could, we could make each other laugh. But also, you know, we had, it was an extraordinary experience because we didn't know what was going to happen one moment to the next, literally. I mean, literally, minute by minute, there, you can probably see there's a door behind me. And, you know, in, in captivity, at any moment, that door, without me controlling it, without me having any rights to control it or any choice over what happened, would burst open and a couple of guards were coming. We'd put our blindfolds and suddenly be, you know, unknown, unable to see what was going on. And we could be bundled up, tied up gagged, put in a, in, in a sack and put in the, moved out in the boot of a car, just, you know, like a bag of laundry or a bag of potatoes, sack of spuds, if you like, uh, moved around like that. And those movement moves were always terrifying. You know, the, the worst bad journey you've ever had, if you can imagine. Uh, and they were all, because you never knew where you were going to go. Where would it, where would we end up? So there was that to deal with, not knowing what was going to happen minute by minute, the desperate thinking always, how long is this going to last? Worrying, of course, about family and friends back home. Excuse me. So we had to keep each other going. And I think, what, apart from the differences, so we had lots of discussions about all manner of stuff, uh, we would share the books we'd read, the films we'd seen. And I think, particularly in terms of, 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 the, of the British Exploring Society, we shared the places we'd been to. So that whilst we were stuck in these little concrete rooms, uh, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot, six foot by six foot, whatever, there were totally blank, bland uh, places to be. We would describe each to each other places that we'd been to. So I would not only maybe talk about uh, um, uh, expeditions to the Lake District, but remember going on family holidays and walking in Scotland in the hills, or especially say going to, to Switzerland and walk in, in a summer holiday and walking through uh, beneath the snow-capped peaks uh, through beautiful meadows of, of, of wild flowers, past little lakes and tarns. And Brian would tell me about walking along the, the rugged rugged wild west coast of Ireland as the Atlantic breakers smashed on the rocks and the shoreline and we'd share that and give each other to try and give each other I guess a sense of, of, of a real horizon you know of moving those blank concrete walls away from us to give us a sense of that world we were so desperate to get back to and we also did plan expeditions um thinking of obviously uh, at the moment uh, BES hasn't been able to go anywhere for a while but you've been doing your Wildestan uh, uh, sort of virtual uh, expeditions. And I was thinking <laughs> that's what Brian and I were doing much of the time. I mean, probably more Weirdestan than w Wildestan, but it, and, and we, so we did. And I remember we at one point had um, books were treasured and, and, and rather few and far between, tragically. Uh, but we did at one point have um, a number of volumes of an old American encyclopedia. And that was brilliant because there was obviously so much information on all manner of subjects, but we particularly loved sections about places. And we got quite, I don't know whether we just had a particular number of volumes that were really relevant to South America. 
and we read about, shared it together, and we were sitting, you know, probably by candlelight, reading this thing together about Patagonia in the steep south, the southern tip of South America, and that apparently there, the, the wide open pampa, the, the grasslands, <coughs> excuse me, grasslands, were so wide, so flat, so huge, that it was so big that you could actually, the naked eye, the human eye, could see the earth curve. And we sort of looked at each other and thought, my God, imagine that being in somewhere so wide open compared to these tiny little cells that we've been confined in for these very over these years we've got to go there and we thought we'll go there and we'll settle there and we'll have a farm and a stancia and we'll have uh, well i said we'll have cows and sheep that's what they do in patagonia brown was had this mad idea that we'd have a yak farm as well and perhaps i'll talk about that again later but but that was so that we kept each other going with these dreams of the future how oh, wacky they sometimes were or yakky they sometimes were but we were going to get through that together we were looking after each other through this we had a journey without maps over which we had no control over any of the schedule over anything and we would keep each other going and we would share those memories that we'd had from the past, the bright lights, if you like, the wonderful wide world that we could remember and imagine the world that we could then explore together. And we were so lucky because eventually we, we were released. After four years, Brown was, went home in 1990 and then the, a year later in the summer of 91, I came out too. And so we were very fortunate. We were very fortunate that awful ordeal ended for us and, and obviously for family and friends and that the, the other hostages we'd been closely in captivity three Americans and fellow Britain, Terry Waite, who I spent my, my last, most of my last year with, all came home and were able to get back to our families and friends. And then, since then, I know I've got, got to let, let you guys in for some questions shortly, and Honor in particular, I won't go on too long, but I have been, since then, really been able to travel the world a lot. As a journalist, I think I'd learned an awful lot from that captive experience um, about listening, listening to other people you know Brian and I had so much time and with the other guys we had so much time to really hear each other out and of course listening is a vital part well for any human being uh, and perhaps we've learned that most of us also again in lockdown now that when you're stuck together in your home and your flat with families and stuff you, you know you've got to give each other that respect and space which perhaps in our normal normal busy lives it, it isn't so imperative but probably has has been so again over the past few months but in captivity it was vital and there was no reason not to listen to somebody you wanted to know what they've got to say but i think that was important for me as a journalist to then think i'll sit back and listen i won't be assuming i know what this guy or this person is going to say when i'm interviewing them i'll find out i'll let them tell me and then that let the conversation go whichever way it may and so i think that was important but also the desire to see the world to understand more um it was interesting i had a book uh, in the first month of captivity that my that had come with my luggage which obviously the kidnappers had taken and they gave it to me and it was a book by uh freya stark a british uh traveler explorer a woman who was uh, traveling particularly across the middle east in the 20s 1920s 30s and 40s and the book had been given me by my mum just uh at that christmas before going out to beirut in the april 86 and it was wonderful it was uh, called beyond euphrates and but it starts in Lebanon, and she sets off from the Mediterranean coast and goes across Syria uh, and, and on in, f further across the Middle East. And it was a remarkable book, brilliant book. And um, and I, I, I read it and loved it and loved it. And what was wonderful was the sense of feeling, this is another Middle East, one that I would like to come back and see. Obviously, it's, it's a different time. It's been 50 years before I'd gone out to Beirut. But she's exploring, meeting wonderful, hospitable Middle Eastern people, seeing different sites, going into mountains, visiting small villages and towns, seeing the architecture. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I, and the, the, the hostage experience didn't break that desire, even to go back to the Middle East subsequently and explore that and try and find some of the scenery that Freya Stark could describe. So that, that was a wonderful thing to, to look forward to doing. And I was able to do it. I was so lucky to be able to travel the world and have been traveling the world ever since, uh, often on, on work projects to all around the world. I mean, there's so many places I haven't been or haven't been to enough. But luckily, and one of the great things, thinking of, 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 of Rildestan or Weirdestan with Keenan, we did get to go and see Patagonia together. We did travel there together and we ended up traveling the whole length of Chile and a, mar a remarkable journey that we shared together. And it was amazing 
to be on that expedition, which we, you know, we organized ourselves uh, together and traveling together. And instead of just traveling in the imagination and watching out for each other in the close confines of captivity, now we were watching out for each other, but in the freedom um, uh, of, of the real world and the exciting new adventure that we were on together traveling and seeing all those sites. And again, it was wonderful to be bouncing ideas and experiences off each other. It was also a really important thing for our friendship because obviously it had been formed in an extremely difficult environment where we were looking out for each other, where, the, where we had to inevitably hold back sometimes just to keep things going because it was so difficult and so tense. Whereas here we could, you know, if we got annoyed with each other, we could storm off out, out of the room and that would be, that was fine. And we could always have a gin and tonic too, which was which was denied us during the captive years. So that was so that was, so was a different thing. But the, the sense of sharing something, and knowing someone so well because of the the deep experience of 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 being on that strange expedition of, of captivity, really made a difference. And it's made a difference, I think, in 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 other ways. All the other journeys I've made, often with with colleagues, whether it's from the BBC or ITV or wherever at the World Service, all sorts of things around the world, and then the people we've met, people excuse me, we've worked with in different places, whether it's back in the Middle East or in South America again, uh, in, in, in India and in China or whatever. And the place people you meet up with too, and sh who share their stories, uh, not only people you're interviewing, but I mean the people you're working with, the local people you're working with, brings such a richness to life. And I think to have that background of, a, of, 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 of an experience that has tested one, uh, that you've shared with someone else, that has shown you different things, different ideas, different ways of looking at the world. I don't mean that people should go into captivity, but what I certainly mean is that people, young people, should get that chance to go on a British Exploring Society expedition because it, will, it really will set them up. Now, I'm going to stop now because I've been talking for too long and, and, and hopefully Honor could come back in. Um, and sorry for choking, I've, I've had a bit, of a bit of a cold. Not a COVID cold, I hope, but uh, just been a bit, a bit, a bit coffee. So um, thank you very much for listening to me for the moment. John, thank you so much. I think probably our audience could very happily listen to you all evening. Um, and I'm encouraging people to forward questions and we'll try and filter them and get through as many as possible. Um, I'd like to just start with one myself and then and then hopefully open it up to the to the wider audience. We have something on our expeditions called post-expedition adjustment. And it's it's that idea that um, it's a very intense experience, even on an expedition. And um, there can be some quite profound feelings of loss afterwards and after the initial excitement of hitting Nando's and going shopping, although even that wouldn't be happening at the moment, there can be a real sense of loss and, and a desire to go back, not least to recover the natural world. Um, you talk uh, about the fact that you had no control over anything over that experience. I wonder how you dealt with choice and actually having control, because I imagine it, it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Was it hard to have choice again? That's a very, very good question. It, it was it's strange. So I remember I got, and I was released in August 91, and um, luckily, uh, well, I was handed over in Beirut to the Syrians and military intelligence, and they took me to Damascus and then met up my, with my dad and brother there, which was brilliant. I hadn't expected that at all. But anyway, we flew back and stayed at RAF Lynham, um, uh, uh, you know, for a few days. And that was great because I had actually a chance to do what some debriefing, if you like, but, but well, that, that's what the military called it. These were RAF psychiatrists who were sort of looking after me and, and a, a bit my dad and brother, because obviously they, they were re recovering from the the experience of, 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 well, they were held hostage too, just in a sense, just like like, like I had been. Um, but it was interesting, I remember on that first night at, uh, at Lino, we got there and uh, my girlfriend, Jill Morell, came and saw me and one of her other friends, and it was brilliant. And then, then they everyone went and they said, well, it's time for, for, for you know, have some food. And there was this lovely lady who was sort of going to go and sort it out for us. And she said, what do you want, John? I said, oh, I don't know. And I turned to my dad and said, um, you, 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 you choose. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and they all looked at me and said, no, you have got to choose what you're mm. going to eat. And, and so I think I chose lamb chops. Um, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. But it, was, but it was a good question because suddenly you realize that you've got endless choice to do everything. At the same time, you didn't know what what, what you wanted to do. It was I, I was lucky that I had support, and I think no, I, I mean the, the psychi psychiatrist help was the debriefing, as they called it, was good. That because that in a way wasn't so much about talking about the hostage experience. Really, it was more about sort of they were very practical guys. I guess being that was their job in the military to get 
get servicemen and women back, 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 back to duty, so to speak. And that was sort of the thing with me. It was basically saying, well, you've sort of dealt with hostage stuff. We'll worry about that later if you need to. We can always be here for you on that. But practically, how will you cope with the days and things going forward? And there might be times when you feel really uh, distressed, um, remembering something from captivity, perhaps, or just confused about the real world. And I do remember uh, a Jill Morale had bought a, bought a flat for us while I was banged up. And I remember being there on my own one day, and this is in London. and. Um, I was walking across the room and suddenly I, I, it was as if I got into a, a blank cloud. I didn't have, it wasn't a flashback as such, it was a fog of where I what's going on. And it was before the other guys had come home, the other Americans and Terry Waite. So maybe that was part of it. It's just a sense of, I can't be here in this pretty flat in, in, in Camden Town in North London. They're still there in that cell. Um, and then I remember another day just trying to make a cup of coffee with an instant coffee, which I, you know, it's quite straightforward as we all know. And I, I remember just, spilling everything everywhere so, just because I obviously wasn't concentrating and it was a, a shock so I thought if I can't do this I, I'm a real freak you know this is ridiculous instant coffee is, is the easiest thing in the world and I think gradually one picked things up whether it was the ordinary bit of business of, of being able to choose something I think it's like I, that, that's the shirt I really want or that's the thing I want to do next or whatever whatever it does it, it, it took time the whole re-entry process I think did take probably years to be fully over the experience. But certainly I would look back week by week, month by month and think, oh, I thought I was all right then, but now I am. So it, 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 that was a slow process and, and regaining and using choice just as one wanted to judiciously it did yeah. take a while, yeah. Thank you, John. That sort of leads me on to another question from, from our um, audience, which was, I don't know how you feel about this, which is whether you have any advice for people who may be struggling with lockdown and their mental health or well-being. Would you feel comfortable giving any advice? Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, I'm not a professional counsellor or, or therapist in any way. But all, all I would say was, and I think this is very much in tune with what we've been talking about, what you were talking about earlier anyway, uh, Anna, is that I think it's, so important to give not only those around you some a sense of space if you can if you're, you're locked up and that that respect for each other and listening to each other but also the sense of space and respect for yourself that you know if you need to say you know i'm feeling really stressed i'm just going to go i don't know into my room or go out for a walk if you can still um uh then i'm going to do that so i think it in a way being sort of it's, it sounds cliche but it is a cliche but it's probably, i hope it's true and the idea is sort of being kind to yourself and also taking time out too I don't know if you found it, but you know, working sometimes, even at home, it's easy for me. I'm here at my desk. Um, uh, but you know, times, particularly, I think, because of this weird background pressure of lockdown and, and worrying about, you know, what will the next job be and all that sort of stuff as a freelancer and things. So I think, hang on a minute, I can't be doing that at the moment. So I will go out for that walk, or I'm going to read just the novel now, uh, or maybe go back to Freya Stark or another or another travel book and, and lose myself in another landscape. I think that's important to do, but also. I think part of that thing is sh the sharing those experiences and, and, and trying to be entertaining each other to a degree, as well as obviously we've got TV and films and Netflix and God knows what and music we can, we can access. But I think sharing those things, and particularly at a time like this when everyone's worried for each other, to be asking each other experiences, perhaps particularly the younger people of older people, about where, where have you been, what have you done, all that sort of stuff. I think, I think sharing memories and places in a similar way to what I was talking about with, with Brian and myself is was, was really vital it gets you through some very can get you through some really dark yeah. patches. You, you talk with, um, with with remarkable openness about the joy of, of the love in friendship and also that the need for curiosity and fun but you also talk really movingly about uh, it coming to terms with solitude within yourself I think you talk about it between extremes in so come home I think you, I've got a quote here which is coming home with the knowledge that there are no finite edges to yourself and the idea that will remote wildernesses give you the chance to come to terms with solitude within yourself I was really struck by those descriptions of the joy of nature and profound expressions of nature it, does that relate to this idea of being able to deal with lockdown because actually you're happy with the contents of your head yes i think so yes i it was quite interesting i remember talking uh to brown and terry way subsequently and we all realized that we actually quite enjoyed solitude not i mean i'll come to this in a moment but despite having been locked away terry wait for god's sake for four years in, in solitary confinement i mean uh, 
he's just amazes me that he's he, you know he held it together at all and for so long but he did brilliantly a remarkable man uh, but, but but we all experience that but the fact that we would want to go to go away and sometimes be on our own some people found strange and yet we didn't and i did but i agree it was absolutely having never been <clears throat> to a, a a real wilderness before i guess going with Bran to the atacama desert uh, I think that would probably be the first time. And experiencing, you know, a desert, an utter wilderness was 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 wonderful because like, it was it's so alien. And you know, realizing if we stay out here, you know, overnight we'll get lost. We we we, we might well die, you know, because it just means that it is that harsher place without water or whatever it might be. <clears throat> and and yet, the, I just found it the most beautiful, mysterious place, which seem to be so wide open, alien and strange, and I think really brought home the sense of one's utter insignificance. Uh, it was amazing. I remember we went to, oh, damn it, I can't remember now, but it was up in the Atacama, these amazing places with lots of flamingos and sort of salt flats and, uh, and, and, and salt sulfur flats, I think they were called. Um, forgive me for not remembering the name of it. But anyway, and we went there and I was just staring at this thing, well, this is the weirdest, weirdest landscape. And these strange, obviously pink birds standing on one leg. But this is just, this is utterly surreal. And I, I went over to Brown, <laughs> who was sort of standing there, just staring at this. I said, wow, this is amazing, isn't it? And it was fascinating. His was, he said, I am fuming. And I said, what do you mean you're fuming? I am so cross. I thought, well, why? Said, this is this place is an abomination, <laughs> and he was like absolutely horrific. And it, and it was so interesting that there was sort of, oh, this is amazing! Wow, wow, wow! And he's just really, really angry that he's been brought to this ridiculous place. And then, but then subsequently, we were, at, oh, I think it's called Moon, the, the, the Valley of the Moon. I've come with something like that. But this amazing rolling sand dunes. And when we got there, I was thinking, oh yeah, this is pretty cool. But Brian went absolutely deliriously, sort of. 10 year old boy happy and was running up and down these dunes with all these other much younger people shouting and screaming and, running. and it, so you know we, we both found that sort of joy in that place and i think it's the the austerity i found inspiring as well as just that sense of being out there somewhere so utterly different and that must be what is brilliant about the, the bes expeditions you know I'm, I'm sure it'll be very different for every person. You, you describe it brilliantly. Um, one of our um, guests this evening, I mean, I, I know memorably you talk about one of your guards asking you to teach them how to disco dance, but um, what they've actually <laughs> asked is, which was a surreal encounter, did you form any positive or even friendly relationships with your captors? I know you certainly tried to be empathetic towards them. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, the relations were always very limited, um, inevitably, perhaps. Uh, they would only be come to the sales briefly fund but there were definitely and it was interesting because we were moved i think i said maybe but anyway 12 or 13 times different locations on one occasion we went back to a previous place we've been held um and often there'd be a new set of guards at the next place uh, so you'd have to get to know them and sometimes that was good if they were all right blokes uh, and sometimes it was bad if they were you know, you know uh, more aggressive or uh, unpleasant people um, and it, when you arrived in a new place you'd listen out and if you heard a voice you thought, oh that's uh, that's Safi as we might call one or Mahmoud well that's good news we should be safe enough here because he's not an, he's not an idiot he's not dangerous he'll be he'll be calm and one or two of them yeah that we became friendly with them and this uh, man I just mentioned Safi hardly spoke any or well, I think about two words of English and a couple well one word of French which was dis pen because when <laughs> <laughs> never, you know, we always wanted we never had watches and we always wanted to know what time of day it was because we were in the dark basically you know might have electric light but that was all oh. so you never knew what time of the day and it was, it was important somehow to always try and keep keep a sense of time and date etc because that was obviously put us back in touch with the real world and i would say to Safi, Safi, what time is it dees and then you know two two hours later Safi, what time is it dees it was always 10 o'clock in, in the in Safi land but he was funny because he, he actually got the idea he got he tweaked that Brian was from uh, Northern Ireland, and that there were troubles between Ireland uh, and uh, and Britain and England, uh, and he was fat. He, he got he tweaked that, and I think he knew that Brian was probably pro uh, nationalist politics. Politics, and so he used to some used to come and say, Brian, Brian, Thatcher, very good, no good IRA, no good IRA, and, and it, it was hilarious. And on one occasion, yeah, he, he took. We were always chained up uh, uh, after the first few months, and by our ankles. And um, he came into the cell and took Brown off and said, come Brown, come, 
I don't know what's going on, but he, you know, he was one of the, the gentler souls, so I wasn't worried because normally if we were taken out of the cell at some strange time, that was, you know, something unpleasant might happen or something strange. Anyway, anyway, to, the next thing I heard, there was this rolling sound just outside the room and grunting. And I realized that they were, they were wrestling. And I thought, what on earth is going on? And this guy's wrestling Brown. And, and Brown obviously knew that he could And then suddenly there's another voice, another guard, obviously in the doorway of that room. Presumably the pistol pointed at Brown, saying, what on earth is going on? And Safi's obviously explaining that. Oh, I'm just having a wrestle with Brown. And the guy's saying, you can't do it. It's a hostage. Put it back in. So, but it was just one of those wonderful sort of moments of totally, utter, utterly surreal. Sort of, Guard, you know, guard takes out so you, you know, the, the, the wild Irishman can have a wrestle and maybe fight, you know, or even as almost as mad as saying, "Will you teach me to disco dance?" So. And do you, do you, or or Brian, um, feel bitterness towards any of the cap, any of the people who were responsible for keeping you as hostage? No, I um, no, I, I don't think either of us do. Um, we, we have talked about it. Um, I, I I remember. Actually, it may have been when we first met, met many, many moons ago when you were in publishing and stuff. But I, I, I remember that I met, met a guy who, uh, a publisher, who I was interested in uh, uh, Jill and I writing a, a book about our you know, captive and campaigning experiences. And, and he, he said, you must be so bitter, so bitter. And I thought, no, I don't think I am really. And, uh, and I, I said, well, no, I'm not really. And it, it struck me um, that whilst I was angry, uh, about some things. I was particularly angry and, and still am, you know, in, in the background, so to speak, about the fact that um, my poor mum was, had cancer and she died while I was, while I was locked up and she never knew that I, I was actually alive and okay, unfortunately. Um, she never knew that. And, you know, she's struggled desperately with her illness and uh, my dad and brother told me when I got out, you know, the, the doctors had said, you know, she should have died two years earlier, but desperately kept going because she wanted to see her, her, her second boy again, her younger son again. Um, and so, and, but they, you know, so I knew that they, all they could have done was take a photo. They knew this because there were appeals from my dad and other people on the news, etc. The, the captors could have taken a photograph of me and said, here is John McCarthy, he is alive, but he can't come home until the government, Britain, whatever, does any, any old loony thing. But they could have just had that, that j minor courtesy and kindness of, of, of showing a diamond that, that you know that her boy was at least all right so i'm angry about that but in terms of bitterness i thought no if, if i'm if i if i'm bitter about this then effectively i'm still a hostage you know because they've still got me and that's crazy because they've let me go they've moved on lebanon was out of civil war by the time we, we came home and, you know they've moved on hopefully they've had other lives completely and 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 so th that, that would that would be foolish however it's it's easy for me to say that because i came home and you know got all sorts of support celebrity status the cbe you mentioned um and got to write books and, and, and then had a, a new and exciting career traveling the world as a journey so i was lucky and you know and i think one of the important things about on that just to, to sort of finish off the idea that i can understand that other people would would, would, would be better uh or, or would struggle to get over a, 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 a bad experience because that bad experience would have happened at home you know what happened to me happened a thousand miles away from London in, in Beirut during a war uh, with terrorists taking us and holding us, you know, and then we came home and that we were lucky and looked after. Um, other people are tormented at home. You know, we're reading tragically about stories of, of people who are locked up together in lockdown and there's more instances of, uh, of domestic violence and abuse against women, against children, against all, you know, everybody. And that's, and that's desperate. And, you know, you, I don't know how I'd react to that. I, what happened to me was a long way away from home and I, I came home, so I was lucky. Other people who won't be celebrated and treated as heroes and asked to write books perhaps will, will be suffering as we speak and in ways that are much more devastating because it's, it's you know, you're meant to be safe at home. And if you aren't, then I, you know, my heart goes out to those folks. I rest my case about you being estimable company, John. Um, um, uh, our future, um, uh, uh, we've got a younger um, participant here who'd like to ask a question um, and obviously it's most important that he gets inspiration. Um, Max, for, who's uh, a mere 14, has asked what advice you would like to tell your teenage self? Brilliant question. So we have to have to tackle that one. Always the, always the hardest questions. Max, that's absolutely brilliant. And, um, and it's, it's really good you answer. My daughter uh, is a year older than you. She's just 15. 
such as starting her GCSEs. And uh, and I hope that's like her. You're diligently attending school every day and doing 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 your lessons or whatever, and logging in in the morning and, and and going through and not purely doing TikTok on your phone instead of doing what lessons you're meant to be doing. Um, <laughs> But I would tell myself, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you that, and I don't need to tell my daughter it, because she seems to be self-motivated, at least in terms of, of you know, of, of ca carrying on with her lessons, even though she can't go to school at the moment. I wish I'd worked harder, not so much at your age, but uh, after A-levels, when I went to university, I sort of lost my way. I had a great fun time, but I didn't work hard. And um, and, and I wish I had done. I wish I'd learned more. I, I wish I'd worked harder, particularly at, at, at a levels at GCSEs or O levels as they were in my days, I did okay. But A levels, I sort of lost my way a bit, and I'd like to, I might sort of sort of think that the teachers could have been better, even though I was at a you know, fee-paying school, which should have been very good. Um, I didn't 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 make much progress there. Got to university, but had a lovely time, made some fantastic friends, um, but didn't didn't work hard enough, and I lamented that, and I also lamented taking it, perhaps being more courageous. Um, I should have been more courageous. I wish I'd signed up for an expedition uh, or whatever might be the equipment or available to me, you know, to go and do something, maybe voluntary service. I wish I'd taken a, a, a year out. Uh, uh, people didn't do gap years so much back then in, in my day, but I wish I'd done that. And I wish I'd sort of gone off and tested myself a bit and then really thought, what do I want to do in my life? You know, what do I want to go to university and what do I really want to study? Uh, rather than just doing it as a normal thing, which was, was possible back in my day, particularly with student grants and stuff. That's a whole different situation at the moment for your, for your generation. So work hard, Max, and be a good lad. <laughs> be, 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 your, be, your, be yourself. And I wish I'd done that sooner in my life. Thank you. And I've got another question actually from Ben Saunders, an uh, uh, explorer of a very different kind. Evening, Ben. And he, I think you might have answered some of the second half of his question. The first half is um, how your personal philosophy has evolved, evolved over the years. And you've sort of hinted at it. So how you might define success, maybe now. Oh, divine success. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not very, um, I don't think I'm a very successful person. It's, it's, I'm not being modest. I just, I'm always anxious that I haven't done anything very well. And, you know, I was terrified before speaking to you all this evening because I thought, oh, I'm just going to mess it up. It's not really appropriate. And then I, and I saw Rory Stewart's talk uh, uh, last year for, for another fireside chat. I thought, blimey, that guy's done so much and he's brilliant, you know. And I've, I've had a chance to you know, explore the world, but I still don't think, I think what is interesting, thinking of that thing about making a difference, and I don't know, I mean, by example, as it happens, perhaps people think, oh, well, that's, you know, it's good to hear from McCarthy, he's survived that experience and there's something of an example there. But I don't think I've done enough with what, if you like, the, the, the public presence, perhaps, of that uh, experience has gave me subsequently. I, I, you know, a couple of, a few years ago, I wrote a book about the Palestinian people, citizens in Israel, not, not those in the West Bank and Gaza, but the ones who, who, who live in, in Israel, a, a much overlooked minority. Anyway, I was very pleased to write that book. I was pleased to have um, written it well, I thought, you know, and, but I haven't sort of followed up on that. And I haven't, for instance, been, you know, uh, done, done other things as a bit of support for the charity Freedom From Torture, but I still feel like I could do more and I, I lament that. So uh, success, I guess I can look back on, on project by project, and if, if, if the reviews of a radio program or an article or a book are good, that's terrific. Um, and I feel good about that. But I don't know, I still, in some weird ways, even though I'm 64 years old, I'm thinking, and the lockdown's a good, lockdown's a good time for it, I'm thinking, so what do I want to do next? Do I want to try and write another book, even though it can be quite a daunting thing? Or do I want to travel somewhere? Or do I perhaps, you know, well, I'd be too old for, for volunteering to, to, be, to be involved with an expedition for BES, but doing something else like that. So it, it's strange. It, it, it's strange that one's constantly thinking, I, I, have I got this right? What, what should I be doing next? So you're still on that journey? Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we're running out of time, but very quickly, I do think we have to, to have a go at this one, which is um, one of our listeners is listening with their 10-year-old son, Luca, and he wanted to ask a question. So we just have a couple of, uh, literally sort of a minute, which is, he wanted to know how many days in captivity were you before the reality and gravity of your situation sank in? Wow. I know. That, Luca, that's, that's amazing. Um, well, you know, it, it was, I think it was probably during, during no, it wasn't. It, no, this, God, this is an amazing question. Uh, I think it wasn't until really I was with Brian, despite the, the couple of months in solitary confinement, 
the horror of witnessing another captive, the, the boy down the corridor, young man down the corridor, being, uh, I didn't realize young people were listening actually, I'm afraid, so, but I hope they weren't shot by that, was beaten and, and murdered, that was awful. Um, but even that didn't quite bring it home to me. I thought this, still there was the sense of this can't be happening or it'll be over soon. And Brian was brilliant because he made me think this could go on for longer. He was much more realistic by that, uh, about that. And uh, actually, so it was probably you know, three or four months before I really thought this could be in for a long haul and we were moved again and things got very dark and one of the, I mean, psychologically and, and, and uh, dark as well as physically dark in one of the places we, we were held together and, and that began to, to wear one down. I thought this, this could be a longer thing. But I always had to think it would just be a couple more months Brian could say, oh, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's, we're now, we're now in sort of approaching February, he said, oh, I'll, I'll give it to East, uh, give it to East, I'll, I'll give it to August. And I said, no, 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 it can only be East, I can't last longer than that. So we had different ways of staggering it, but it, I think it was with him that I realised, right, this is in it, so how now do we cope? How do we keep going? And that was when we sort of started thinking, let's dream of other places that we can think about to keep us going until the doors really do open, uh, rather than just the doors of our imagination. John, I can't think of a better place to end. I, I, I would happily listen to you and share questions with you all evening. Um, contrary to um, the way in which you would describe yourself, I do think you're a completely inspiring um, and a great role model. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to share some of your experiences and wherever you are on your own philosophical journey in life. Um, I'm so pleased that you were prepared to join us. Um, and to everyone else who joined us for this evening, I'm sure you will share my great pleasure in having had some time with you. Um, you will also forgive me for reminding everyone that uh, we're a charity. John agreed to join us because we need more John McCarthy's in future. Um, our world will be a much better place if everyone was um, able to find such a generous and philosophical way of tackling challenges. Um, we would all be the richer for it. So if you are able to help us on our journey as an organisation, um, in any way at all, uh, we will be immensely grateful and we will be able to help more of the young people who are experiencing considerable difficulty today, tomorrow and the next day. But I'm sure you'd want to join me once more. John, thank you so much. It's an enormous pleasure to have spent an hour by the fireside with you, however virtual. Um, uh, feel free to throw another log on and uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. I think we have another fireside coming in April about which we'll share some news soon. But John, thank you again and good night to everyone for joining us.